Um, thank you everyone for coming. So today we have Iska, who is a, a grad student at Columbia working with Greg Ryan. Um, so given the technical difficulties we have, uh, can anyone on Zoom confirm that all the sounds are okay? Um, uh, I'll move there to anyone else. Yeah, there's a response. Okay. Did they just say something? Okay. Sounds cool. So, you said something. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, Chris is working with. Uh, Greg Bryan at Columbia, and he's an expert in galaxy formation and the CGM in general. So uh, today, Chris will be telling us about uh, the work that he has been doing for the past couple of years um, at Columbia. So yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, so great introduction. Great introduction. Again, I'm Chris Carr, graduate student coming from Columbia. This is my first time visiting the West Coast to here in sunny Pasadena. I'm very different, I'm adjusting, but it's, uh, it's, it's been a, a productive process. Yeah, so I'm here to talk to you about some work I've been doing over the past few years revolving around the dynamic lives of the of galactic atmosphere, so the gas surrounding uh, the, the galaxy. And, and over the past few decades, we've learned quite, quite a bit about the various properties of, of the sort of galactic medium. And, and if we're going to begin with sort of a quick dissection of sort of the major properties, of the CGM. You know, first we have first we have this first we have <laughs> oh, okay. Yes. So first we have you know this this volume filling hot phase of approximately 10 to 6 to 10 to 7 Kelvin. And this phase is revealed to us primarily through our through our X-ray observatories. Predominantly from the high ions, uh, oxygen seven, oxygen eight being the, the most abundant uh, of, of these ions, and we can observe directly the hotter and denser components of this hot phase through their direct X-ray line emission. While through absorption line spectroscopy of the intervening gas between us and bright background objects such as uh, quasars or, or bright or bright stars, we have access to a much larger range. Um, and density and pressures that we can probe. And so through the combination of, of these techniques, both in emission and absorption, we find a hot phase of, of both the virial and even evidence of the supervirial component at densities of roughly 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the minus 5 uh, cubic centimeters at uh, number density. And, and when we descend to the lower temperatures, we see thousands of these cold clouds made of neutral and low ionized gas organized into these great complexes across the sky, shown here in the shaded regions, and also to the, the small crosses, making the, the presence of the neutral uh, H1 gas. And these represent some of the coldest and the densest components of the CGM, and are also defined by their high velocities uh, in both directions along the line of sight, both, both, coming, both, both coming towards us and, and away from us. And we also have evidence of this of this of this uh, tenuous warm gas around 10 to the 5 Kelvin, or it's a little higher than that as well, identify the presence of these intermediate ions, such as oxygen 6, uh, which is believed to exist at these cooling interfaces between these cold clouds embedded uh, in this, this ambient hot medium. And these cold clouds uh, can have multiple you know, different origins. Uh, for example, you can, have, you can have it stripped off satellite galaxies, like what seems to be the case in the southern hemisphere, around the, the large and small uh, Magellanic clouds. You can also have a direct accretion from the IGM, a sort of metal core uh, accretion of, of pristine material from the surrounding cosmic environment. And you can even imagine uh, precipitation of cold clouds that perhaps existed in this sort of, in this volume filling hot phase that, that, that was able to sort of cool and rain down uh, from the galaxy, rain, rain down from the CGM onto the galaxy, fueling ongoing star formation uh, in, in the system. And of course, we, we also have evidence of these, of these powerful winds uh, 
launch from the galaxy uh, itself. The, the prototypical example where you, you're kind of obligated to show in every talk about winds is M82 and this beautiful composite image stretching across the wavelengths from infrared, the optical, uh, and, and the X ray. And of course, we will return to these, to these winds later in this talk, but this is sort of just a general introduction to some of the, the very important components of the CGM. But, but for now, these winds are, or these galaxy scope winds carry, are believed to carry mass, energy, and enrich the CGM with metals uh, and dust. So we're, we're putting all these different components together. Uh, this volume putting hot phase, that gas, cool, cool gas raining out of this hot halo that goes to feed the galaxy of gas, goes on the blowing stars, some fraction of that launches these hot winds that then interacts with the CGM, and the process goes on and on. And, and under this picture, thinking of the CGM as a galactic atmosphere serves more than simply as a sort of useful analogy, but also reflects a deeper ecological relationship that the CGM has with the surrounding, with their, with their, with their galaxies. And just like with any sort of ecological system, small changes to one aspect can have far-reaching implications uh, down, down the road. And, and so thinking about this connection more in a more ecological sense, I, I think is, is, a, is part of this emerging framework that, that I think carries a lot of weight in thinking about how these systems interact and evolve over time. But there's still pretty, a few interesting questions that, that are still unknown. Like, so how exactly do these galactic winds couple to the, to the gas surrounding galaxies? How does it affect like the global properties and star mode and climatic properties? Also, what role do the satellites play uh, in, 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 this, in this picture? Do they, how do they, in, in terms of feeding the CGM with new gas and affecting the global CGM properties? And with that, how, how is the gas spatially distributed around the galaxy? Is it truly in these, these sort of simple, you know, spherical, quasi-spherical quasi models, or is it patchy? Is it inhomogeneous? And how do the winds and the satellites contribute to, to shaping the spatial distribution of gas around the galaxy? And so with that introduction, I wanted to sort of serve up two projects that I've, that I've worked on uh, for my PhD, first dealing with, dealing with the winds, and second with the satellites. And so with that, I'll move on to the first part of this talk of talking about is the, the galaxy CGM connection and the, and the role the CGM may play uh, in this process. So beginning, you know, supernova feedback is believed to be a powerful regulator of star formation in low mass galaxies, both on the local ISM scale, but also at the galactic scale. So in the simple picture, you have these hot expanding bubbles from supernova that break out from the galaxy while entraining cool gas from the interstellar medium to go on to create these large-scale multi-phase outflows that carry mass, energy, metals out of the galaxy and into the CGM, or perhaps even out into the IGM. And we can quantify how effective these outflows are at launching gas out of the galaxy by defining a very familiar term uh, in this field, which is the mass loading factor. And so the mass loading factor, you know, very simply defined, just the mass which is escaping the galaxy, and these outflows divided by the star formation rate. And this, and this property of, of the winds plays a vital role in, in the galaxy formation process. And so here I, I plot the, the, very, the very famous of stellar mass, halo mass relation. So, just, so this is just telling you how a given halo mass, how many stars do you expect uh, in that. Uh, in that halo, and so this is this is taken from the, the, the from the Bruzzi 2019 relation, and this white line here on top is what you would expect for a given halo. How many stars you would find in that halo if the galaxy formation were a simple story of gas sort of cooling onto these dark matter halos, fragmenting and going on to form you know, stars and so forth. And what immediately should come up to you is that this simple picture of galaxy formation versus what we what we seem to derive from the real universe disagree with each other by several orders of magnitude. And this was a, a really big issue in the sort of the early days of galaxy formation theory of thinking about how do you close this gap? How do you explain the inefficiency 
of star formation that halos across different scales. And we think now we, we've developed this, this picture where at the high mass end, so everything's sort of extending beyond the, this figure, you know, AGN feedback is believed to play a key role in regulating star formation, while on the low end, you know, supernova feedback is believed to play uh, a much more prominent role. And from the earliest simulated models of galaxy formation to the current state-of-the-art cosmological simulations, the mass loading factor up here, especially for these low mass halos, is expected to be very, very big, much, much greater than one in order to explain the low gas fractions, the low metal, the low metal fractions, and the low star formation rates in these low mass systems. However, when you when we look at observations, we try to measure eta n of these winds directly. In the real universe, the picture is a lot less clear. So here's a collection of recent estimates of the mass loading factor. They call it beta, but it's it's the it's eta m from both from both a, a few h alpha uh, from a few observations in each studies in h alpha and from UV absorption. Pennsylvania studies both trying to constrain the warm phase, the warm phase component of the gas carried uh, in these outflows as a function of stellar mass compared to a few predictions from uh, large scale cosmological simulations. So I want to point out two things from this figure. Is that first that not only do large scale simulations give different predictions for what the mass loading should be, you know, for example, it's 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 higher in TNG 50 than what than what the Eagle simulations per day. But also that the observations themselves, even at similar stellar mass and probing very similar probing very similar phases of, of the gas, can give, can give radically different estimates for what the mass loading is uh, in, the, in these systems. And, and I know there's always a danger of trying to make the, these you know one-to-one -one comparisons between simulations and observations. And so so I think it's very much an unsettled area whether or not whether or not these two different, whether they actually agree or not. But I, I want to sort of ask a more provocative question, which is, is if is the mass carrying these winds really the key property of these outflows we should be thinking about if we're trying to understand the, the role that these winds play in regulating galaxy formation? Because remember, not only do these outflows carry a lot of mass, but they also carry a lot of energy. Uh, as well. So not only do they have these cooler phases, uh, which 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 may be carrying a bunch of the mass, but you also have these sort of hot, this hot, fast moving component, best observed in the X-ray, that and the, the, that may carry much more energy. And this is also reflected in winds produced in these ISM patch simulations of galactic winds. So, so rather than sort of thinking about these sort of large scale cosmological or even galaxy scale simulations, if you zoom in doing these simulations that may cover a, a few a few parts a few kiloparsecs that actually have the resolution to to resolve itself consistently how these supernova winds interact with the surrounding multi-phase interstellar medium, the winds that, that produce that produce self consistently from these simulations, they find that the majority of the mass is carried in these cooler phases, while most of the energy is carried in these, in these fast moving hot phases. And so they introduced a new quantity here, which is, which is the energy loading, which since this is tracking the fraction of the amount of energy that are, that's injected in from the supernova that's carried out uh, in, these hot, in these hot winds. So this, so this is just a collection uh, of these small, of these small scale simulations or different estimates for or for A to E, both in the hot phase and in the cooler phases, and you know, it's dominated by, by the smoke phase, and they find values of A to E of around 10, about 10 to 30 uh, percent of, 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 uh, of the fraction of the supernova energy. But these, these fractions can get even larger, considering if your supernova are clustered, or depending on the different environments that, that these supernova go off in, all of these can actually be your A to E is much closer to unity. In these social situations, this is without AGNs. No, yeah, no AGNs. So this is just for you know cluster, you know supernova feedback, and in and these sort of low uh, Milky Way scale systems and, and below. And so, could the energy carried in these winds play a key role in thinking about how 
how how these lower mass systems could be regulating themselves, representing a different way of thinking about uh, about how this how this process operates. And so, folks in the past to try to understand feedback in very simple and intuitive ways that have adopted these these gas regulator models, where you can sort of treat the the CGM, the ISM, the stars as as these different reservoirs or bathtubs, uh, if you will, which exchange mass and metals at different rates within a growing halo. And these flows can be modeled using sink and source terms in the system of ordinary differential equations, where given some initial condition, you can solve in this, this couple system of ODEs to get solutions for the mass and metals in each of these components as a function of time. And the mass loading here is just Free parameter that you can sort of you can sort of twiddle with, very modulated up or down, and see how it affects the overall properties, global properties uh, of the system. But the real innovation of our work that was tracking not only these sort of bulk flows of mass and metals between the different components, but tracking the flows of energy as well. And so through this sort of global accounting of the thermal energetics of, of the CGM allows for this sort of simplified but self-consistent treatment of CGM heating and cooling within this gas regulator context. And I also wanted to point out some companion papers, which were, were here, we were focused primarily on sort of the thermal flows between the different reservoirs, but we also have some, some, some companion works which consider the kinetic energy flows as well, and also the potential, the potential of energy, which is from in a, in a forthcoming. And so, getting in more up to, into the details of how this, of how this, uh, this, how this sort of energy regulated framework operates. And so, first, you consider the heating that goes that comes from from the supernova themselves. So, this is the energy carried out uh, in in these in these outflows, which is proportional to 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 eta e, which is another free parameter that you're that you're, you're free to set. And so, then, so as these as these winds go out. And escape to the CGM, they heat the surrounding gas and gives the gas additional thermal support against gravity. And when that thermal support exceeds the restoring force from gravity, this heating overpressurizes the CGM and causes it to buoyantly expand beyond the bounds of the greater radius and, and out of the halo entirely. And we assume that this process occurs on the order of the sound speed uh, of the halo. And so through this expansion, not only are you lifting energy out, but you also lift out a, a proportional amount of mass with it as well that you, that you, can, that you can estimate just from deriving by the specific energy uh, of the halo. And so, so as you're sort of lifting material out in sort of global thermal expansion, not only have you raised the temperature of the CGM, but you also lowered its density, which limits its cooling efficiency. And so, it, and so in this sense, you were, by, by regulating the cooling efficiency of the CGM, you limit how much gas is able to enter into the galaxy in the first, first place, and thus regulating star formation by cutting off by cutting off the, the, the faucet entirely from, uh, from, from fresh accretion uh, from the surrounding from the surrounding atmosphere. But it also does more for you because if you have gas that's being cut up in this thermal expansion, which is lifting out of the halo, it can interact with the surrounding cosmic environment in the intergalactic medium. And so this gives you an additional halo scale preventative feedback as well. And so, and so we assume that this sort of gap preventer, which is sort of limiting the, the, the accretion of fresh material from the IGM, is proportional to the energy flowing out of the system compared to the energy that would be coming in through this cosmic accretion. And so that sets this fraction here. And so that's so that's what the underlying mechanics like of this model uh, of thinking about the role that the CGM can play in regulating the gas supply and the star formation uh, in these uh, in, in these sorts of low mass systems. And so that's the model. So give you giving you a sense of how this can work just in a single halo. So these are tracking you know the different flows for a 10 to the 11 halo mass system. So think you know a little less than the LMC scale and, and below. So this is tracking the energy flows, the mass flows, and the total and the total mass of each component as a function of time. And so the, 
the, the disk halo interfaces. So um, think of the winds, the cooling are the, are the solid lines, the halo scale flows are the dashed lines. And what you find, you know, after some initial period of, of some non-equilibrium uh, physics where like you have so sort of like rapid cooling at early times as it sort of feeds the early, the early galaxy and star formation, you quickly arrive at this at this equal at this equilibrium state and then the energy flows where these halo scale outflows tend to, to, to line up pretty nicely with the heating coming from the winds. And this tight regulation also also works to keep the cool the cooling low in, in these systems, resulting in very little and so you know you have really rapid cooling at early times in the mass flows as that eats the early galaxy. It, this sort of tight regulation keeps keeps the cooling low at late times and also works to keep your CGM as is relatively constant uh, over time. And so with this sort of energy-based framework, you're actually able to achieve you know, stellar masses, which are with, consistent with what you expect with these sorts of halos. And, you can, and this is all being done with very, with very small uh, mass loading factors and, and less than 30% uh, of, of the energy escaping in a supernova way. So that's the case for a single halo, but we also want to see how this works over over a full range of halo masses and compare it to establish galaxy scale relations, like what we saw earlier in the stellar mass halo mass relation. So here is looking at the stellar mass stellar mass halo mass relation from earlier from Gruzi, and seeing what happens if you sort of decide on some traditional set for the loading factors and you vary one at a time and you see what happens. And so in this case, we, we you keep the energy loading and the, and the metal loading fixed, but you vary the mass loading. And quite remarkably, what you find is that, your, is that your resulting stellar mass seems actually quite insensitive to what you're seeing for the mass loading, but quite, but quite sensitive to what you assume for the energy loading in, in these bins. And this is quite consistent with this picture uh, that, we've been, that we've been developing, that as we increase the energy loading, this, this sort of this sort of thermal expansion of the CGM, this process becomes much more efficient, which sort of limits the amount of cooling that's able to be done uh, in the CGM of these low mass systems, so it lowers the star formation. While here, the reason why the mass loading seems to be very insensitive is because as you increase the mass loading that's being launched out into the CGM, while keeping the energy loading fixed, you lower the specific energy of the CGM, which increases its cooling efficiency. So the more mass that you kick out, the more mass that seems to cool back on top of you. And so the end result is, is that the stellar mass seems relatively unaffected. But of course, you know, none of these actually do a, good, a decent job of, of fitting the, the relation of the Bruzi stellar mass halo mass relation. And so the, nat the natural next step is to, is to say, okay, and if what value for your energy loading actually gives you the best fit uh, to the Bruzi uh, relation, and so that's what we so that's what we do here, and so these and so the white the white points are, are just are are just the the, uh, the the best the best fit values for the A to E that sort of lands you on, on this on, on the Bruce relation, and and we found that kind of it's this power law fit that, that scales with halo mass, and this is just this fraction uh, this sort of F per minute term that 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 sort of that kind of falls out uh, of the uh, of the uh, of, our, of our cosmic accretion term, that, that we find that this process should be very efficient in these low-mass halos, but the increasing, the increasing efficiency as you, um, as you reach the Milky Rose galaxies. And both of these conspire in a way to get you, to get you stellar masses in line with, in line with the Bruzy fit without sort of having to rely on, on, heavy, on, on the heavy mass loading uh, as in many traditional models. And also thinking about what's what's coming down the pipe. So this is some uh, future work that's been led by Mark Voigt from Michigan State University, who who is building on sort of the thermal model in addition to the in, in addition to the kinetic flows, but also tracking the potential energy flows as well to try to explain in a bit more detail why exactly we find this 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 dependence from A to E and and insensitivity to, to mass loading. And so we're, we're mostly exploring this case when winds are able to efficiently couple to, to the CGM. And we find that the in, in this case, energy loading is, is far more sort of 
powerful aspect of the feedback, which is, which is controlling this Alex's regulation, were in the case when your winds aren't able to efficiently couple to, to the CGM. In that case, mass loading tends to play a very key role in, in, regulating, in regulating the star formation and not so much the, the energy loading. And also, this is sort of related to this case of, of thinking about the, the specific energy in, in these winds compared to compared to the halo specific energy or the, the specific energy that the gas would have had as it accreted it would have had as it accreted onto the galaxy. And so when so when these winds are able, so when these winds are delivering more energy than, than the gas originally had when it was accreted, that's when the feedback uh, is most effective. However, even regardless of whether your winds are coupled or uncoupled, mass loading still leads to some difficulties. Because as you increase the mass loading, as we've sort of indicated earlier, you lower the specific energy of the winds. And so even in the case of, the, of an uncoupled outflow, mass loading can lower your, your, stellar, your stellar fraction, but, it, but there's, there's a limit to how effective mass loading can be. And so in, in either case, in either of these sort of two extremes, you still end up in a, in a state of crisis if your mass loadings are too big, where if winds are coupled, and then you, you can end up with this large-scale contraction of the CGM because you've mass loaded it so much that it sort of triggers this one-way cooling event. Or in the case when they're uncoupled, then you, you're launching these heavy mass loaded winds, which are which are traveling at low at largely low velocities, and so they undergo these these really short duration uh, re recycling uh, re recycling uh, cycles uh, that that also limit the effectiveness of mass of mass loading. And so that's why so that's why we think you know that the that there could be a lot of promise in thinking about this regime where winds can efficiently couple to the CGM, where energy loading takes uh, takes center stage in this regulation. Um, and so with that, I so I give you sort of like the key take home message from this first part, which is that that energy that high energy loading and low mass loading can present sort of another sort of regime and parameter space that, that is really worth probing and, and thinking about star formation in these low mass systems. And, and so with that, we go to part two, which is which is sort of recognize the fact that you no know, galaxies and their CGM do not evolve uh, in isolation. Um, in fact, you know, galaxies are often members of dynamic communities with nearby neighbors, satellites, and we should expect the CGM of massive galaxies to be in constant interaction with inbound satellites and, and mergers throughout all of for all of cosmic time. And if those satellites are massive enough themselves, even they may possess their own CGM that is now in the process of colliding and interacting uh, with the CGM of other central host. However, despite the ubiquity of these satellite CGM interactions. In our, in our universe, the right the role that satellites play and, and our sort of current models of the CGM still needs much to be desired. And this question you know, even extends to to our own to our own sort of uh, own galaxy, where where we have our own pair of, of gas-rich satellites, the, the the large and small Magellanic clouds. And we used to believe, you know, that the Magellanic clouds were, were bound satellites uh, to the Milky Way on sort of long duration decaying orbits around the Milky Way, with the orbit parameters were best chosen to, to match the properties of the Magellanic stream. However, like over the last decade, from you know, high precision space-based measurements of the proper motions of the clouds across the sky over, mul over multi-year baselines from the Hubble Space Telescope and later from from the European Space Agency's Gaia, Gaia satellite, we now have much better constraints uh, on, the, on the kinematics uh, of, of the clouds. And so, so, so we now believe that the LMC and the SMC are on their first passage uh, of the Milky Way. And we also have estimates of, of its current tangential velocity across the Milky Way and moving in, and it's moving on the order of, of 320 kilometers Per second, and in addition to like the sort of fast moving you know satellite in, in our vicinity, we also have better mass estimates uh, of the clouds, particularly for the LMC 
that currently place it on the minimum 10% of the Milky Way's mass, and even as high as 20% uh, of, of the Milky Way's mass. And so putting these two things together, both its first infall and the considerable mass uh, of the LMC in particular, we find that, that the LMC is a large and recent perturbation to our galaxy. What changed the estimate of the LMC mass? Of the mass? Yeah, yeah. So you can so there, there are a number of ways you can you can sort of dynamically infer the mass of the Milky Way for in large part through its interaction with nearby structures in the Milky Way, so like stellar streams, uh, for example. And so like so if you observe some like some like deflection in the stellar stream orbits, you can use that to constrain like the mass that the nearby curve would have to be in order to produce that effect. So that's one way that uh, you, you can estimate its mass. Um, and also just Given its its current you know stellar mass where, where it falls on more up to date stellar mass stellar mass relations, it seems that if the LMC is is at least you know, ten to eleven solar masses on the small side and perhaps even larger than that. You know, of course, you know, this recent perturbation has motivated many in the Milky Way dynamics community to probe the large scale response of the dark matter and the stellar halo to this passage. And so as the LMC passes through the halo, it, it transfers energy and angular momentum to the dark matter halo and generates the density weights uh, in, the, in the dark matter distribution. And as you can see here in this figure that to me has always looked like the human brain in, in many ways, you, you find this transient weight that sort of that, that trails the LMC along its past forward trajectory. You can think of this similar to like your classical your change they are the dynamical friction weight. In addition to this sort of large scale collective response, which which is uh, which is a result to it in large part to, to the reflex motion uh, of the inner Milky Way with respect to the outer Milky Way, where like if the inner as the inner, as the Milky Way so falls towards the lat falls towards the pericenter position uh, of the LMC that causes this, this offset in, in your density distribution where looking away from the LMC you perceive an over, dens an over density because, because, uh, because gas which was now denser gas which is closer to yourself and shifted to larger to larger galactosecond gal radius where the opposite is true on, on, the, on, the, on the near side the southern hemisphere because now you're closer so now gas which was initially um, low, lower density is now closer to you, and so this, this gives you a perceived shift of an, of an over density in the northern hemisphere and an under density in the southern hemisphere. And these, and these, and these enhancements are quite significant. So in the transient weight, this is, you can find enhancements on the order of 0 0.3, 0 0.4, sorry, 30 to 40 percent, and then in a collective response or 10, on the order of 10 to 20 percent enhancements. And so this has led to a number of observational predictions of how this would affect you know, the observable tracers of, of, the, of the halo, such as the stellar, looking for signatures for this dipole response in the stellar halo, or collections along, along this transient, along this transient, uh, this transient wave. And so as someone who actually got their first start in research in grad school doing black and dynamics, and now someone who has sort of transferred over to thinking more about CG and science, for me, when I was thinking about what projects would interest me and, and what sort of exciting areas that no one has thought about, to really started with a very simple question of what about the gas? You know, because if we also have you know, a, CG, a CGM of gas surrounding the Milky Way, how, does, how has the gas responded to this recent infall uh, of the LMC and not only improving sort of interesting observational tracers of this logic galactic response, but how does it shape so the global so the thermal and kinematic properties of, of the CGM? How, how has that responded? And so, the, and so to start getting at these, these sorts of questions, I've been sort of running my own sort of idealized you know, run, uh, resolution test simulations of, of a Milky Way like CGM with an infalling LMC like satellite. These are simulations being done in Enzo which is a finite volume hydrodynamics code with adaptive mesh refinement for high temporal and spatial resolution. And so we begin our simulations with, the, with these initial conditions of, of if you have like a CGM an approximate hydrostatic equilibrium with some live dark matter halo. And 
and also and also these simulations are that they're these are as of now like they're fairly fairly targeted so like we don't include you know, an ism there's no rate of cooling or, or star formation we can always consider thinking about adding these additions in the future and so what you're seeing here this this is the the in projection the the number density of the cgm of, of the milky way and also of the cgm of of an lmc like satellite in the, in the Z to the ZY plane, so we'll, we'll see in a second as, as the satellite moves. And so we, we include a satellite um, on, on a similar orbit trajectory of the LMC, and we do these runs with and without an LMC CGM itself. So some runs we just have the dark matter only LMC, that's what allows you to isolate the dynamical response, and including runs which include its own CGM, so you can capture the full CGM CGM collision. And so we can see that now. Okay, so we can see, so we can see as the LMC starts to sweep below the disk uh, as it falls, the star marks the average position of the LMC's stellar disk, and so the grand pressure from the Milky quickly starts to blow all gas away, and you also start seeing the formation of this compression front up in front of the LMC's position. Destroy the gas. <laughs> <laughs> I'll watch it again. Yeah. I'll remember what it looked like, you know. So and so and so the simulation ends with, with the LMC around the US present day position, which will end at, at, at around here. And just from visual inspection alone, you, you can see that the presence of, of these impulse satellites can produce very large scale changes to the surrounding gas distribution. Around, around these systems, around around uh, around, uh, around the Milky Way's, uh, around the gas distribution surrounding the Milky Way. So, what fraction of its mass did it lose up to now? Sorry. What fraction of its mass did it lose up to now? The LMC's CGM. Yeah, and so by so by the time it, it reaches its present day position, a very small percentage of the gas remains found. So, virtually all of the initial primordial CGM that that the LMC fell into should have been should be stripped to sort of follow this this gas tail, which I'll show you in a second. Yeah. And so if we want to be a bit more you know, quantitative to see like how how this interaction is shaping so like the global properties of the CGM, you can do a comparison between like the density you you would expect for like the isolated Milky Way and do like a residual subtraction between the Milky Way the isolation. Versus, versus the isolated case. And so what's being plotted here is just uh, this sort of Q quantity. Q is just a standard for any physical quantity uh, that you, you can think of. And so this is, sort of, so this is really just plotting like the fractional enhancement of, uh, of, the, of, of the CGM properties. And so I, I wanted to sort of highlight a few interesting features in, in this figure, because they're, I think it's very exciting. So first, you have evidence of this sort of global collective response, just like what we talked about earlier uh, in the dark matter, where you have like this sort of slight, you know, uh, enhancement in the northern hemisphere compared to this slight under enhancement uh, in, in the southern hemisphere. You also have this strict LMC chromic gas, which which, sort of, which actually tracks quite nicely onto the past overall trajectory uh, of the LMC. And in addition to that, you also have well, this, this compression front right in front uh, of the LMC. And we believe this is the merger shock of the LMC propagating through the Milky Way CGM as a product of this CGM CGM collision. And you can look at this not only in density, but also in pressure and in temperature. And so, in temperature, you, know, you see the strip, the strip gas, you know, you know, reveals itself right? again. So you have this this cool strip gas along this past overall trajectory, and you also see the shock front, you know, emerging quite nicely. While it, whereas when you see in pressure, you don't see that you know the, the strip gas is clean as you would expect, you know, across you know contact is not very and fluid, but you do see, but the shock shows up most prominently uh, in. Uh, in the pressure, because you know, shocks, the shocks, shocks generate their strongest response 
uh, in the, the strongest jump is in the pressure. And so in summary, we see that the infall of, of, these, of these massive satellites like the LMC should be generating like fairly significant changes in, in the, the global milk ray CGM properties. Yeah, there, there seem, seem to be some uh, rings in the northeast quadrant. Is that like a gritting effect or, or, or what? Like these? Yeah. 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 Well, what's that from, I guess? Yeah, so like we, we haven't, so a lot of these rings didn't really start showing up until we started running at higher resolution, where we think these could just be sound waves, which are sort of rippling through the CGM. Like as, uh, so as the, LMC, as the LMC is falling in, the, 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 not only do you get like this massive shock front from the LMC, but the, but the Milky Way itself is, is also moving. And so, we, so we think this could be sort of, these sort of shock waves rippling from the Milky Way during, during the interaction. So you say that that case, that they say in the enhancement in the trail, it's quite very difficult to say. But this is the case, it's the whole process. So we're supposed to share another gas chip from the RMC, not how the gas chip is caused. So let me know. There's a couple slides, but we're talking about this. So just to sort of reinforce the fact that, you know, this is in fact, we are looking at a shock probe. We also look at the changes in the large-scale entropy of the gas. Well, because in shocks are dissipated processes, so you should also expect a jump in the entropy along the shock front. And so this is so this is the CGM response when you include the, the LMC CGM. And and just and just as where we saw the jumps in the density, pressure, and the temperature, you also see this this jump in the entropy as well. And also like the low density gas stripped uh, from from the from the LMC. Whereas when you compare that to the simulations which don't have gas to, for your LMC, and so you just have dark matter falling in along the mass orbit, you don't see those same large scale features. You do see hints of some of these sort of faint low level large scale changes, but this is more a product of, from the bulk motions of the gas, less so from, from the hydrodynamic interaction. And so, and so this jump here is actually, you can actually measure like how strong this jump is, and it's consistent with what you expect for approximately a Mach 2 itself, which aligns with the LMC's uh, kinematics. And needless to say, it's also quite huge, like on the, like on the order of the view of radius of the halo. And this is because if you have a CGM on the LMC that's, uh, that stretches out to, the, to your view radius, it's a much larger surface area for this collision to occur. And so, so as a part of that, you get these, these very large uh, features. And so we, we can also look at the response in gas kinematics. So this is looking at the radial velocity and also the tangential velocity. And, 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 and so thinking about the radial velocity, you also get sort of this low level collective response in the radial velocities as you, this is from the reflex motion of that, of that inner, of that inner, of the inner Milky Way from the surrounding uh, dark area, from the surrounding halo. So that's why so you, get this, you get the same sort of low level reflex motion, which should be present you know, everywhere, like across the sky. And you also, and the other two prominent features, just from the stripped cool gas, it should be moving at very, very fast velocities moving towards the Milky Way. So this would be a stripped material along, along this past orbit. And, and the stripped material also makes itself seen at the tangential velocities of the stripped component that should be sort of moving at similar velocities. This recently stripped gas should be moving at similar velocities to the current you know, you know, velocities that, that we find from the LMC itself. So these are you know, of, similar, of similar magnitude. You have a question? Two or three minutes, okay. I'm, I'm getting there, I'm getting there. Okay, and so also we can kind of explore what are like the underlying connections between like this dark matter halo response and the CGM response. And so this is looking at the response in the dark matter halo. You know, as you saw in the graphic earlier, you have like the transient weight, you have this collected scale, scale weight. This is in the density, right? And so, and so when you just have oh, the LMC without gas and just the dark matter, you get this very, you get this very similar you know, large scale collective response and from the dynamical friction weight. But then once you start including the, the current itself, then you get that stripped gas component. So to answer your question uh, from earlier, you, the, the gas response should be larger than the dark matter response because you have this superposition of not only the dynamical 
response from, from the interaction, but also the, the addition from the collisional hydrodynamics that, that come from the shock. And so, and so usually when I, when I present this work, you know, the, 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 the obvious you know, next question uh, that I get you know, every time is, is this observable in the Milky Way's CGM? And the answer is, well, we'll see in a second, maybe. And so I just want to point out, you know, these are works in pro these are works in progress. So I'd love to you know, talk about it and hear, and hear your thoughts. And so one way, you, so one way you can make progress towards answering this question, if these are truly observable features, is to try to make these sort of the sort of mock all sky maps of the sky. So this is just looking at the column density, very simple calculation, to sort of take an integral along every line of sight. And so this is this is for the isolated Milky Way. So there's no LMC here. And so you get a result which is now exactly what you would expect. You know, this is in galactic coordinates. So you get sort of a dense collection in the center that falls off. You know, the, as when you look away from, from the galactic center, and these sort of narrow bounds just reflect the minimum and maximum um, for uh, for this uh, for this simulation, where there's no high set. But then once you include the LMC, a few interesting features start to pop out. Not only do you get the, this stripped gas component along this path over trajectory, but you also start seeing the faint edge of the shock discontinuity imprinted across the sky. And so I, I think one very interesting outcome of this sort of work is are, are these signatures in the southern hemisphere uh, in, 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 the gas, in, in the gas density that perhaps is as an outcome of this, of, this long, of this interaction. You can also consider other you know, observables like the, so the off skies or CGM uh, X-ray surface brightness. And so like before, this is the isolated case uh, very, very smooth, not, not many interesting features. But then once you include the, the LMC, you also get this, you also get this enhancement in the in the X-ray and the X-ray signal along along the shock front. And so and so and so so I, so I think one of the real predictions coming out of this book is is this sort of shock contribution to, to the X-ray to the X-ray emission perhaps surrounding the LMC and perhaps you know, globally you know, across, I guess, hemispherically, you know, across the, uh, the southern hemisphere. And so the, the last thing I'll show just to sort of, uh, sort of step back to like where could all this be going and sort of thinking about the next step of the next few years is I've also been involved in con so continuing this, this sort of semi-analytic work, but also thinking about satellites as well. And so I'm happy to be part of this new emerging collaboration led by Raj Pandya and Greg Bryant. Uh, trying to build a sort of next generation of uh, like -like models that try to explore the galaxy CGM connection, not only including this more advanced form of feedback, thinking not only about mass and metal energy flows, but also thinking about satellites uh, as well, and, and how that affects the global CGM properties, and, uh, and considering the sort of mass energy contributions from the satellite winds uh, as well. And so I'm, I'm happy to be part of this work and, and see see where all this could all be going. And so with that, I'll leave you with, I think, the two take-out home points from both ends of this, of this project, that thinking more, thinking more deeply about feedback, and particularly the energy carrying these outflows, and also the presence of these massive satellites may also be, may also be, may also be producing fairly significant disruptions to the CGM of galaxies like the Milky Way, and perhaps other Milky Way like galaxies, but which they possess their own satellites and directions. So with that, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks for a great talk. Uh, so your model in part one uh, talked about energy input from supernova feedback, but there was nothing really in the model that was particular to a specific feedback mechanism. So like in principle, one could plug in an AGN feedback energy input and potentially say things as well. Uh, I was just wondering if you've thought about that and like whether this model may have implications on, on that side of the feedback equation as well. Yeah, exactly. In, in fact, a lot of the motivation for for thinking about supernova feedback as this as this heating source that can sort of heat the surrounding gas and prevent the inflow of accretion was 
lot of that theoretical heavy lifting was done a lot earlier in the AGMP back in place of massive galaxies and, and, and clusters uh, as, a, as a way of heating the surrounding you know, gas around these massive galaxies to prevent you know, like the, like the overcooling in these massive systems. So absolutely. And, and even though I'm not directly involved with this myself, there are the efforts within the broader collaboration to, to, to extend these sorts of models to higher masses to include the AGM feedback. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Great, thanks. <laughs> uh, great talk. Lots of things uh, to ask, but I'll keep it constrained for now and bring up test later. With the second part of your presentation about the Magellanic Cloud, have you done any comparisons with the distribution of the Magellanic Extreme that's observed to be partially due to this ramp pressure stripping, but also there's like a tidal component that kind of leads and it looked like in your model there wasn't any needed component, but I was just curious if you did any more clear uh, comparison with that observation. Yeah, so one difficulty with making comparisons to the Magellanic Extreme is that we don't have an SMC, which is, no, which is believed to make be a substantial like, component, especially to get you that leading arm. Because you know, as, the, as the SMC is being so tightly stripped to its past interactions with the, with the LMC. So, so we can't make precise comparisons to, to the Magellanic Cloud, but, but I think absolutely in the extended component uh, of the LMC. In fact, even in that, in that sort of all sky figure I, I showed at the beginning of the talk, you, you do even see some hints of some extended warm gas that actually carries carries that sort of, at least in my, when I was looking at it earlier, I think could actually be sort of tracing that extended component of the warm gas as a simulation of predictions. And just to tag on to that, related to that, you have these kind of induced modes in other quadrants with that Magellanic interaction that was inducing the Milky Way's halo to have like an overdensity here relative to the case when you didn't have the gas that was present. Um, have you considered ways that there might be, again, observational signatures, perhaps an overdensity in the, in the free electron content in that portion of the sky that might be picked up in pulsars or MRBs or something like this? Maybe, yeah. I, yeah, but, you know, and I would get card idea, you know, kind of have great conversations with. We made the observers there, particularly about you know, uh, FRBs, but so, uh, yeah, I'm thinking about like if if these can be if those sorts of probes can be used to sort of identify these, these sort of substructures uh, that we're finding uh, across the sky. So so yes, the answer is yes, but I think there's many more conversations I'd like to have about uh, what what is possible. Yeah, so the first part. Uh, Great talk. I mean, first part, uh, have you looked at like the star formation rate or like star formation history? Because I, I, if I remember correctly, like North Galaxy had reverse star formation, mm -hmm. and it didn't in your plot. It looked like it kind of had like a steady star formation, which is counterintuitive. So. Yeah, yeah. So, so of course, when you just have like a system of like coupled ODEs, like those sort of like boom and burst cycles that that would be part of like a realistic description of the history can be modeled these sort of simple uh, ODEs. But but I think you've identified like a very clear sort of discriminating thing that could be used to discriminate between these two sorts of uh, feedback models because you know a lot of that burstiness uh, is a in these sort of dwarf simulations as you're sort of lifting out so the heavily mass of gas and then falls back onto you to, to trigger these sort of these sort of cycles of boom and bust. But if the feedback, you know, was to, was a bit more gentle, you know, and it wasn't sort of producing sort of, sort of, if, it, if the feedback were less explosive, then then I, I expect the feedback would still be bursty a bit, but perhaps not to the same degree in the case when, when the feedback is primarily ejected. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, Stock, um, I have a question about the second part, which was. Um, have you looked at the metallicity distribution um, of the C of the CGM, or sorry, the Milky Way CGM, and how that was affected by LMC? So, so not in not in these simulations, but but I think metallicity could be another could be a, could be a, so another interesting observational probe, especially if the stripped material from the LMC isn't sufficiently mixed with uh, sort of the background ambient uh, CGM, 
And so if you did have sort of like this continuous sort of feature across the southern hemisphere of like metal core, you know, fast moving material, then that could be a, another observational uh, effect of this sort of large scale response of the CGL. Last question. Now, sure. um, your plots of the density enhancement, you see like a lot of great light structures. Is that a feature on the EMI core, or yes. is that like something that has like a plan with the past? Yes, yeah, so, so these are simulations that I've been able just to run on my laptop, but now we're, we're pretty much as soon as I get back to, to the city, we're going to start writing the higher resolution of so to produce, you know, a bit more, you know, Pretty, you know, more aesthetically pleasing you know, plots that were actually included in the, in the paper. But, but yes, that's definitely, that's just a result of that. Yeah. All right. And I will speak again.